Okay, then, so our next uh, speaker is Jonathan Smith from uh, Halle. And so we will talk about machine learning thermodynamically stable materials. And uh... okay, thank you very much. So, first, I would like to thank the organizers for having me. And then, yeah, Jack already um, talked a bit about um, machine learning in general. So, we had kind of a revolution in a lot of different fields over the last years. Jack already mentioned. Um, the image recognition or image segmentation that is now completely dominated by machine learning algorithms. Then we have um, games like Go um, or StarCraft that were maybe more in the media and where we now have superhuman performances by um, AI algorithms. <clears throat> then we have autonomous driving that has also made a lot of progress over the last years, mostly based on machine learning algorithms. And then we have natural language processing and there we had first the recurrent neural networks and um, word to vector um, algorithms and so on and then in maybe some of you have heard about it in 2017 we had the attention is all you need paper or transformer models that has now over 30,000 citations a few years later and that completely changed the landscape again and then we have um, applications, oops, this is kind of laggy. Then we have applications in science and there in at least one field, we also had a revolution already in protein structure folding or prediction. And yeah, there we have the CUSP competition every two years and the last four years, this was completely dominated by um, some machine learning models or the alpha fold models. And now part of the problem uh, might be considered solved, only a small part, but there's been some amazing or revolutionary progress. So I don't think we had um, or completely this revolution already in our fields of maybe chemis uh, quantum chemistry, theoretical solid state physics and material science, but um, we already had a lot of applications. And before I start with my specific applications, um, I will just mention a few of them. So maybe no matter what problem you are working on right now, there might be something interesting there. So we can kind of separate everything by the amount of data that is used. So um, we have this small data domain. Um, in our case, that's often experimental data. So in solid state, um, we barely ever have experimental data. And if we have any, maybe a few hundred values, and so here we have um, very little data, and, but we can adjust the models. And so usually the models will be quite bad with this little data, but then we can use interpretable models um, like these two. Um, what exactly they do doesn't matter for now. And just that they give you some extra information whether sh you should trust the prediction. So for example, this kind of model will produce a formula for you then you can use your scientific um, knowledge and understanding to say, okay, this seems like a sensible formula for my regression problem or classification problem or not. And this will also give you some local information about your prediction. So if you have these small data sets, um, you can use methods that give you some extra um, certainty in your prediction. And yeah, then some applications that, um, we also worked on is, for example, correcting band gaps. So DFD band gaps, which are quite bad to be closer to experimental values or volumes. And then other people have worked on formation energies and um, superconducting uh, superconductors predicting the critical temperature and so on and there. I mean, a lot of these um, small data applications, but um, the most common um, regime is probably and this medium data where we have maybe a few thousand data points to 100,000 data points. And here we really only have um, theoretical data, um, mostly DFT data. Sometimes we have some higher fidelity theoretical data like um, GW maybe, some G uh, few thousand GW band gaps. And then yeah, we can use all kinds of models like regression trees, um, models, random forests, some basic and um, fully connected or convolutional networks like Jack talk, talked about, or maybe some small 
graph networks, um, what graph networks are, um, I will explain later. Yeah, then here we had a lot of applications. This is just, just to mention a very few force fields are maybe the most successful application yet, I think in chemistry and physics of machine learning, or one of them. Um, yeah, where we can now build for any solid uh, or crystal structure system, um, a force field um, that is quite a reasonable close to density functional theory. But they are not really um, transferable yet to um, uh, different systems. But still, you can also use them to calculate then phonon or Raman spectrum. And uh, yeah, it's already very useful. Then we have a lot of material property prediction here. We have everything from band gaps, of course, to bulk and shear moduli to grain boundary energies, and really everything. And there are probably hundreds of different properties that have already been predicted. And yeah, this usually just to avoid or doing more DFD calculation or uh, more expensive um, calculations. Then of course, also learning exchange collation functionals. I think we will have a talk on that later as well. And then lastly, we have this um, big data regime where we have million, millions or hundreds of uh, thousands of data points. And here we only, at least in my domain, we only have DFD data. And then we can use really complex network topologies and millions uh, and a lot of millions of parameters. And I think this is um, maybe, even though this, we can't do this for a lot of problems, it might be the most interesting um, regime in the sense if we consider all the revolutionary applications I mentioned before. Um, nearly all of them kind of lie in this large data regime. So when we can apply a lot of computational power and data to solve our problem. This and where machine learning often produces um, the best results. And yeah, some applications here may be quantum chemistry force fields where we have data for quite a lot of molecules. Uh, for example, the ANI um, force fields. And then um, this is what I'm going to talk about today, um, predicting thermodynamic stability or distances um, yeah, to the convex cell. We'll also explain later. So this is just a short overview maybe of the different kinds of problems you can consider with machine learning in our fields. And yeah, now the outline for the rest of my talk um, will be um, this questions of predicting new materials. Why do we actually want to do this? How do we find them? And then a history maybe over the last few years how machine learning has progressed um, up to our newest models. Uh, data sets and results, and then maybe what's the plan for the future. So why do we need new materials? Um, it's um, quite an urgent question um, because we could really need some alternatives to current technology. So for example, we have the neodymium iron boron magnets in electric cars, and I think more than 80% of them then in wind turbines and other applications where we need permanent magnets. And I think some estimates are we need roughly, and yeah, sorry, we need this prosium um, to actually improve the properties of these magnets. And I think some estimates by Toyota are that we need around hundred grams at least per electric car. And so if we want to change to all electric cars, this will quickly become a problem as the production, worldwide production is around a hundred tons. And this order of magnitude. So yeah, this will um, become very important in the next years to discover, discover alternatives here. Similar for lithium batteries that are essential for um, a lot of things in our daily life. And yeah, um, here we have cobalt. Um, I think some projections say that the demand will increase 50 fold until 2030. And the other problem with it is not only do we, when we need a lot of it, but it mostly comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And of course, then there are a lot of labor and human right issues associated um, with this production. So discovering alternatives here would also be very nice. And then there are a lot of, um, yeah, more of these materials where we need alternatives, but also new technologies like that we would really like to have like P-type transparent conductors, room temperature, uh, transparent paramagnets, or even high uh, or 
room temperature superconductors that we can use in industry would be very nice. And so the first step for all of these applications is that we need um, materials that might be, might be viable for that. And so we need to discover them efficiently, which means um, with a theory. And so the next question, um, how do we determine the, um, the stability? And so usually um, we will have some compound, in this case, a binary compound um, of uh, the elements A and B. And then we will calculate the energy with density functional theory. And then we will have to consider all other compositions or structures um, that contain only the elements A and B that are in our databases. And we'll have to compare the formation energies. And then we, we will get this convex hull of thermodynamically stable materials here. And if the material lies above the hull, it has a positive distance. And in this case, it will be most likely unstable. And so this problem of learning or predicting thermodynamically stable materials can be reduced to this question of the distance to the convex hull, which will be yeah, the quantity uh, that we're interested in uh, for the rest of this talk. Okay, um, so then, yeah, we usually take a prototype crystal structure to do this efficiently, like for example, the perovskites, and, and we just check uh, whether, uh, which elements we can fill in for um, these um, positions A, B, and C, and um, which ones of these will be stable. So if we take 64 candidate elements, we will arrive at 250,000 compositions. This will be maybe a million core hours, something in this order of magnitude. This is still feasible. But then if we want to do thousands of prototypes and larger structures uh, that are less symmetric or even quaternary structures or quintary ones, this quickly becomes impossible to do solely with um, DFT and yeah, uh, supercomputers. And so here's where the machine learning comes into play that we want to predict um, this distance to the convex hull instead of just calculating it with density functional theory. So the work on this started um, more or less um, four years ago, and some other groups were um, even a bit earlier. And at that point in time, the models were quite simple. So we had um, these elemental features, usually the, maybe the atomic number of each element, the electronegativity, the position, the periodic table. So anything that represents um, our structure, or in this case, our composition, um, just like um, you take the images um, for image recognition here, we need something to describe our structure. And then we have um, yeah, quite simple models at this time, decision tree models like extremely randomized trees or random forests. They are very easy to use. If anyone wants to try it out, it will probably take you um, yeah, 20 minutes with the libraries that exist by now. And then maybe some simple fully connected neural networks. And yeah, this was already quite successful. So quite useful um, at this point in time with training set sizes of 20,000 systems, we could get errors of roughly 120 milli electron volt per atom, um, which allowed us to reduce um, the number of DFD calculations we actually have to do by roughly 80%. Um, yeah, we also tested this for some other tiny prototypes and the results were quite consistent. So this was already quite nice um, to do 80% less DFD calculations. But now if we want to do quaternary perovskites, and um, I think in 2018 or so, this is what we tried next. We already have 15 million compositions. And now if we use these same basic methods um, and even use a much larger training set of 170,000 uh, training systems, we still only get this error, which is just not good enough to differentiate the stable ones from the unstable um, compositions here. And so um, we need better models basically. And also one of the main problems is that here, every time we do a prototype, we need our own training set as our features or our representation is only based on the composition. And so, yeah, um, this is um, quite problematic in the sense that every time a lot of the DFD calculations we have to do is just to produce the training set. So then um, some other people worked on this problem of 
predicting and properties on based on the composition and made some progress mostly by uh, making deeper or creating deeper neural networks and more complicated ones. So um, here we have from 2018 also just a deeper neural network with then maybe I think 2 million parameters where we just take a vector of our um, input composition. We just put a zero for everything, every element that's not there. And then the fractional composition. But here we um, notice a problem and that's already if we have any composition um, A, B, C, and now we want to switch the positions in the crystal structure. So we switch A and B. So we have B, A, C, three then this input vector will stay the same. And, but the output should be completely different from a physical point of view. And so these are not really applicable to our problem. We can now extend this by taking for every um, element or position or composition one of these vectors, then we can differentiate between them again. But now we are fixed to one prototype, which is also not what we wanted. Then we have more complicated versions of these where we take a picture of the periodic table. And these all improved upon the errors, but they were not um, really sufficient yet. And so we uh, need something to work efficiently with the, period, um, sorry, with the crystal structure as an input so that we can use um, all the available data that we have to get the best models out. And yeah, now the idea um, to um, get the best models is to use um, crystal or molecular graphs. And what we have to do is um, we convert our structure or molecule um, to graph by taking one node or vertex for each atom. And then we will choose just a vector to represent this originally based on elemental features. Now we just have parameters, um, so-called embeddings that we train. And then depending on the distance um, of one atom to another atom, the atoms will either be connected by edges or they will be, uh, will be not connected. And then we'll also have vectors um, representing um, these embeddings, uh, sorry, these um, edges or edge embeddings. And usually they were based on a distance expanded in a Gaussian basis or something similar. But um, this is um, very great. And these models are uh, um, based on these crystal graphs as input are very successful. But we have a problem here. And that is that this precise geometry and this um, distance is actually unknown for new materials. So if we um, want to predict something or do our high throughput search through, uh, for our prototype, we just know roughly the crystal structure or the symmetry when we say we have a perovskite prototype, but we didn't do the geometry optimization yet. So we don't know the distances. And if we put in the wrong distances, because we don't know them, the prediction will be um, really bad. And so in our uh, most recent work, we kind of adjusted um, these networks to our purpose by replacing this um, exact distance dependence just um, based on the graph distance. So now, um, instead of saying this is um, three angstrom um, removed from the other atom, we just say it's the first neighbor or second neighbor. And this information is now quite imprecise, but we'll still be able to learn from it. And the main thing is that we will be able to enter unrelaxed structures as inputs effectively and yeah, predict, uh, do predictions this way. So how do we actually arrive at our predictions? And here, the idea um, that we use is called uh, message passing, um, it's, um, or message passing is the principle behind most uh, graph neural networks. And so we have our embedding, or our starting vector for each atom i. And then the idea is that each um, atom j in the neighborhood will send a message to this atom i. And based on this message, we will update the representation. And then we will repeat this process a few times, in our case, five times. And afterwards, um, the representation of the atom I should be adjusted to its neighborhood. So instead of having a representation that says this is an iron atom, it should say this is an iron atom in the neighborhood of two oxygen atoms in this crystal structure. And yeah, um, the advantage behind this um, procedure um, with doing multiple steps of message passing is that 
the information quickly becomes more non-local. So the first step, we just get the information from these embeddings. But now the second step of message passing, these embeddings were already updated based on their own neighborhood. And so now we effectively get more non-local information while keeping our parameter number and everything quite limited and having the correct um, yeah, equivariances. So the only difference now in all these graph neural networks is what kind of update functions do we use? There have been a lot of successful um, update functions here, far too many to mention them. And what we are going to use is the attention mechanism. Actually, how much time do I have left? Hmm? Okay. Uh, 10 minutes? 11, okay, then I have to pick up a little bit maybe. So maybe not go through all the details, just the basics of this attention mechanism. And so maybe this is what um, revolutionized also a version of this, what revolutionized um, in, um, natural language processing in the last years. And the, so the idea in for attention in graph networks is that um, we will um, put the uh, concatenate, let's say the vectors that represent both nodes, the one that receives the message and the other one that um, sends the message and then the edge. We will put them through one of these fully connected networks that Jack's expl uh, Jack explained to us. And then we will get our message out. But now we have the question, does this atom J actually have something important to say? So should we pay attention to it? And in order to answer this question, we will have a second network that will calculate some coefficient Z and then these coefficients will be normalized with the softmax function and between zero and one. And now these attention coefficients are going to tell us, um, is this message important? So we just multiply them with each message. And then this will mean, okay, the message of atom J to atom I is important or uh, we shouldn't pay attention to it. And yeah, and then the point is, and we, maybe we don't want one opinion because um, we all have different interests. And so maybe what as some might consider this atom J or the message from it totally unimportant, but others want to um, learn more from it. And so we'll have multiple attention heads. So each pair um, of these networks here is one attention head. And then we will have multiple pairs of these networks and each is going to calculate pairs of messages and attention coefficients. So we can have um, different aspects of our chemical space represented here. And then we will put all of it together and in the end add it to our basic represent, uh, sorry, to our starting representation. And then we will repeat this process a few times. And in this way, we can hopefully get a good representation of our um, chemical space or crystal structure. Now um, for our edges, we just do the same. So um, just that in this case, we don't have multiple atoms that send messages in, but we'll um, still use um, the same me uh, mechanism because obviously um, a first neighbor between an iron atom and an oxygen atom will again be completely different to a first neighbor, um, oxygen, fluoride, um, whatever. And so um, this edge or let's say bond representation also needs to be updated. So then we get um, such a large network out. First, we have our embeddings that represent our crystal structures and our um, graph distances. Then we have uh, multiple layers of message passing that um, should produce good uh, representations for each um, vertex. And then we'll have another layer um, built um, based, or let's say on this work, more on this work that will and give us some global information about the com composition. And based on this um, information, we will again use the attention mechanism to say, okay, and um, when we put together the representations of all the atoms, this is important for the representation of the crystal structure, and this is less important. And so in, then we arrive at one representation for our whole crystal graph. And then we have one big output network, let's say like a fully connected network that gives us our distance to the convex cell. So of course we also need large data sets for this. 
uh, for large networks. And so we combined some data from various more or less compatible databases. So this was quite annoying um, to filter this to get the compatible parameters, eliminate all the duplicates and so on, and then get a large, um, larger compatible database. So um, here um, you can also find um, this data set, just that for the materials project or a flow, um, you will only have the IDs to then download from their database. So then we trained on this um, large data set and um, you, we could get some excellent predictions um, for our test set with errors better than chemical accuracy. However, um, there's a small problem here and that is that this is um, the error in the distribution, let's say, of our training, validation, and test set. And then if we, in this case, we removed all these mixed perovskites from our training, test, and validation set, and, and then tested on them nevertheless, and we get this um, quite horrendous error. And here the problem is just that we have a dis so-called distributional shift. These mixed perovskites are just very unstable. So on average, they are one EV further removed from the hull than uh, the compounds in our training set. And so we get this high error. And yeah, but if we consider compounds closer um, to the hull or from these mixed perovskites, we get quite a nice um, error already. Um, if we consider the beginning where we had um, 170,000 training systems for these max perovskites, and we got an error of 180 millielectron volt. Now we have zero specific training systems for the mixed perovskites, and we still get a better error. It's already quite nice, but not sufficient. So we did some transfer learning where we take this pre trained network and add some training data for mixed perovskites. And here we can see we can definitely get a lot better than purely compositional models. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, the network with pre-training, so that was trained on the large data set, also performs a lot better. And yeah, in this way, by having a structure, um, a model that considers the structure, uh, we can save a lot of calculation time for extra training data. Now, yeah, we also considered um, predicting the relative stability of polymorphs. So to check whether our, our model, despite the imprecise information on the crystal structure can um, accurately predict, um, let's say relative stability of compounds with the same elements or the same composition, but a different structure. And this worked quite well. So once um, we only consider um, polymorphs that are at least 100 milli electron volts removed from each other, we can get most of them correct. Yeah, and now um, kind of the last um, important point. Um, this is um, so far, all the predictions and tests we did were for relaxed structures because this is what is our training set and test set. However, the application or the point of the application was that we wanted good predictions for unrelaxed structures so we can do high throughput searches. But now we have a small problem here. If we take a cubic crystal structure, then um, we can expand it or compress it and the neighbor list um, basically won't change. But if we have a um, tetragonal structure like here or different symmetry, the ratios of these cell constants are going to change. And consequently, the neighbor list and the network output is going to change. Uh, but there's a quite simple solution for this. So we just take multiple cell constant ratios for our prototype. And then we get the minimum, take the minimum energy as prediction. And in this way, um, if we take uh, multiple structures here as input, um, yeah, we can get very close to the relaxed structures. Okay. How much? Sorry, uh, 27. Okay. Um, yeah, just we did basically, we did this high throughput search for the mixed perovskites, and yeah, it was quite successful. Found some stable, quite a few stable materials and quite a few that are very close to the hull that can probably be further stabilized with some distortions. Um, yeah. So um, to summarize, um, the crystallograph attention networks um, can um, really accurately discover new materials from uh, unrelaxed structures. And 
uh, predict other properties accurately as well. We already tested this, but haven't published anything um, for this yet. And yeah, the future challenges are basically this bias in our prototypes and um, the elements in the data set. So um, of course, these are from, um, or mostly the structures in our training set are from high throughput searches that other groups did. And they have some specific interests and prototypes. Um, also us, I mean, we have probably added a few hundred thousand perovskites, Heusler compounds and um, others. Um, but um, most prototypes are very badly represented and similar, a lot of elements, for example, all the lanthanides are very badly represented. And so we need to correct that to get good predictions for everything. And then of course, there's the point of the accuracy of density functional theory. So the PBE functional and that we're using is of course um, a great functional, but um, still the formation energies um, are not that precise. And so um, ideally we would be able to use a, a more precise functional like the scan functional. And so, yeah, this is what we are working on in the future. So reducing um, this bias with active learning and further high throughput searches, and then increasing the accuracy of our training data. So we have um, already calculated um, most compounds of our original data set of um, 2 million um, structures that were close to the convex hull with PB soul and scan. So this is around um, 175,000 or structures that is published here now um, with scan and PB soul. And in the future, it will be um, more like 200 something thousand that one can use to um, get their own convex hull and scan. And then for example, do high throughput searches with that. And of course, now we want to yeah, explore the chemical space of all known crystal structure prototypes with a lot of computing time and hopefully find some interesting materials to solve some of the questions from the beginning of the talk. Okay, so many thanks um, for your attention and to all the coworkers that yeah, helped with this work. Yeah, okay, thank you very much, Nathan. Okay, so the session open for, uh, for uh, questions. Go ahead. I have on to slide 30. Yes. So I wasn't fully following with respect to this uh, aspect of the, of the ratios. Yeah. Especially the part where you said that, that this was no problem because you can just take different ratios. I'm not quite sure about that. So yeah. Maybe can you so, so. Um, let's say then in practice, it turns out to be, not be that big of a problem. I mean, basically, um, if you would take the exact distance information, then if you optimize the geometry of the structure, I mean, this information will change a lot. But now if we, and just have this um, graph distance, then anything or that um, mean both and anything that won't change just the neighbor list. So which is the first neighbor, second neighbor, and so on, will not produce any changes in the output of our network. And hopefully, even if we have the unrelaxed structure, but it has the same neighbor list, basically we still get the correct output for the relaxed structure. Now, if we optimize these um, mixed parasites. <coughs> And then we have different, I mean, um, basically some are stretched in this direction and others are stretched in this direction. And this will produce a completely different neighbor list. And so um, we will never um, know the exact neighbor list for the relaxed structure without doing the prediction. But if we just consider a few of these side considerations, so a few of these different structure possibilities, we can come pretty close. And in this way, if we then take the minimum energy, we are pretty close to the error we would get with relaxed structure. So kind of we're doing our own rough or cost grained energy um, structure relaxation. Um, yeah, that's, that's yeah. And you know from experience which sort of ratios between crystal structures yeah, are so usual, which we, distortions happen. So yeah, on. so we um, um, usually when we do the high throughput searches, now the first. Um, we do multiple rounds. The first round is without any training data. And then we, then we really have 
don't really have a lot of ideas. We can, we just know from symmetry considerations, I mean, which are possible and just take a few. And then once we do our first round of predictions and we will um, have some data set where we uh, can then check how's the distribution of the ratios and then we can do another round of predictions here now with a model that is transfer learned to this data set. And then we, yeah, get better results again. So these here with these um, four, we, these are basically based on our training set, what we know are sensible uh, set considerations. Okay. Um, can you get back to the attention yes. procedure? Because this was, I, I have to admit, a bit complicated for me. Yeah, so this, um, yeah, sure. Especially when I thought I understood, then you start to co concatenate many things, and then I got. Uh, yeah, so this is the same. This concatenation here is first just put the information together to create one message from point A to point B, what is sensible, basically together as a message. Uh, and so we just put the vectors together and put them through one fully connected um, network that learns what should be the message or whether we should pay attention to this message. Okay. Now, I think you mean, or the question was about this? Yes. yes. And then, yeah, so here then I um, didn't have that much time anymore. So here and the point is that um, we have always these pairs of networks here with these indices n, and each pair of these is one what we call one attention head. So let's say it's one person creating a message and saying where well, maybe another one saying whether we should pay attention to it. And then, but we want to consider multiple of these because they might have different opinions what is important in our chemical space, and so. And we will combine and we will get some output here for one of these attention heads. And then we will combine multiple of them so that we can consider multiple aspects of our chemical space. Yeah, but this concatenation is, yeah. uh, is, uh, is uh, again uh, a linear sum or is uh, something that uh, creates a sort of uh, logical union. And so only yeah, if so they, they do agree then this message goes through no this is um so here we have multiple possibilities um, and we can either average of i mean actually you can do a lot of stuff you can also do something like you just suggested with the agreement for example in our case we either average over them so we just take the mean of the vectors um, or we concatenate them so we just put them one after another and then put them through another network okay okay Okay, thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Why did the prediction was so good for the perovskites, but not for the mixed perovskites? Sorry, this were and um, for the perovskites in the beginning? Yeah, for the simple case. Yeah, so um for the simple case, and um, we think it's just um I mean there's a lot less variability in this um space and with the 250,000 composition. So if we have the tra training set of 20,000. And there, um, I mean, we are already at basically 10% of all the systems. And then if we have 15 million systems, it's more difficult um, to get there. And also, I mean, we have so much variability, maybe all the net and um, the models still have the same number of parameters that we tested there. And so I'm not sure if they are even able to um, yeah, learn everything um, that is in our data set. Okay, so we have uh, when been with the question. Go ahead, please. Hi, thanks. Thanks. Very nice talk. Uh, I have I have one question about uh, the edge attribute. Do you use? So you mentioned that you use something. Uh, how uh, how many bound distance uh, away from the reference node, right? Yeah, so this graph distance, how many, which it's the first neighbor, second neighbor, third neighbor, and so on, yeah. Is, is that means that you, uh, your edge attribute only have one dimension? No, we use an embedding for this. So uh, this means that we have a trainable vector that is 
um, initialized randomly. And then it will be trained with gradient descent like all our other, other parameters. So in this case, it's actually a vector of dimension 512. Mm -hmm. uh, then I don't understand uh, if, let's say, uh, if the chem uh, chemical bond, uh, it, if it is uh, the first uh, near, near risk neighbor and the second near risk neighbor, and what uh, are the difference between this uh, two edge and bending? Yeah, so um, we basically have a lookup table with trainable parameters that will have one vector for first, uh, first neighbor and one vector for second neighbor. And then um, the machine basically takes or knows this first neighbor, so it takes the, uh, the trainable vector for first neighbor and uses it here in the computation and um, so on for second and third neighbor. Okay, uh, then another question is, can you learn some property on operandal condition? See that your, uh, uh, the bound distance can be changed during the reaction. Yeah, so um, I'm not really that much of a um, chem. I know, so in chemistry, there are a lot more ways to represent this bond distance or to represent the bonds because um, there's much more information um, about it. And I'm sure people there have, um, or maybe people there have already considered this for us, it's just um, the energy at zero temperature, zero pressure, and calculate with EFT, basically. Mm. And so, I mean, I know there are some networks that consider, um, for example, temperature and pressure. I think the magnet reference I had in here might um, already consider that, and, and there are other works out there, but we don't. Maybe just say that you, if you can play around with your uh, neural network, then what must be the, the things that you have to change for the architecture or? Mm, for it to work with different, uh, over reaction with different distances then the change. I mean, for that, I would probably not take our network. Um, basically, um, then I would probably take a network that really considers the um, distance in a more precise um, manner. There are a lot of these, um, and yeah, I think they might be then better suited to the problem mm -hmm. than, than our network. And if you want to consider um, these changes and differences during reactions, I mean, maybe, and there, I mean, there are a lot of networks that are more similar to force fields. And as far, I mean, as far as I understand, or well, the question you're discussing, and I think these might be better suited than our Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I have other, other points or questions or doubts. Okay. I have one more small. Um, like, can you give an idea of the number of attention heads? Like, what, what's the number of ends? In, in such a model? Good question. What the number of ends do we use right now? I okay. check like I know how deep it is. It's probably something like six, six, maybe six attention heads. You can. I mean, you can use more or less fast. It was more, I mean, the experimenting with these large networks is quite um, computationally expensive. And so fast it was like, um, slowly or increase the number of parameters. And so the number of attention heads and the size of the embeddings a few times to see um, until we get no further improvement. But, and this is one idea, I mean, for now modern on language processing where this attention me mechanism, not exactly this one, but it's also based on this principle here in a way. It's also used there a lot of more attention heads are used, for example. So it, it's more trial and error. Okay. I have a very, a very, uh, maybe it's an obvious point, but uh, is your, in, in your perovskite structure, yeah. Uh, if your A and B, for instance, yeah. do they need to be atomic position? Uh, or I mean, do they need to be atoms? Or they can be a group of atoms, for example? 
I mean, if, so if we would, in the perovskites, if we would take group of, group of atoms, we would just consider that um, composition then with the group of atoms instead. So they, in our case, now for this network, they need to be atoms because, I mean, each node um, is um, trained to represent M1 species. So, it, um, but, I mean, of course, you could train them um, if you would now um, change your training data or the representation of the training data such that um, you have kind of a cost grain representation where they one of these nodes represents some chemical group or something or group of atoms, then you, you could do that. Yeah, no, I ask this because you mentioned in your uh, perspective that uh, we can go now beyond that, beyond the ternary or quaternary point. But for example, just limiting on the case of the perovskite, for yeah. example, if you go to hybrids, there they have uh, big groups like the methyl ammonium, then lead iodide. So in that case, there are a lot of constraints in, in what is now, for example, your A and B. They are not just a bunch of atoms completely independent. No? So they could be considered maybe as a whole to... Yeah. So I but think, this is, you said, maybe it's another kind of networks that you have to build up. Yeah, I mean, I think um, if you have this question, maybe you would, I mean, if you're in, or basically the problem is the scaling with the composition, if you really want to consider all compositions, because I mean, quaternary, you're at 15 millions, then I mean, we really get um, scale very, very quickly, but maybe you're interested in one or 10 of these groups and just want to, I mean, change the rest of the composition for your high throughput search. So, I mean, inputting a larger structure into the network is not really a problem with um, more different um, if you can, uh... species, but of course, then in the end, if you want to do a high throughput search for a, a quaternary compound, it's, I mean, that's a lot of data um, already. Yeah, I agree. Okay, then. Um, I don't see any other uh, questions from, uh, from the participants. So in that case, well, I will thank again, Jonathan and, and um, and Jack, sorry, and um, we can have a pause now and we resume uh, in, uh, in half an hour.